Good morning, Mobile County. I am Mrs. May, and I'm going to walk you through some eighth grade physical science. I'm going to start out by reviewing some of the things that we talked about on the last episode so that you have a good foundation and we can move forward. The topic for today is property of waves. So we've been talking about wave energy, lots of energy moving around through molecules and states of matter like solids, liquids, and gases. Next week, we're going to get to electromagnetic waves, which do not require a medium or matter in order to pass through. So let's go back to last week a little bit, and we're going to look at some of the major players in wave energy or wave properties that we need to know so that we can talk about wave behavior, how waves behave in our world. All right, a wave. So a wave is a disturbance or a vibration that transfers that energy from one place to another without transferring the matter. And after that energy wave passes through, the matter returns back to its resting place. And the best example I could think of that, we talked about last week, where people are in a stadium, uh, like an athletic stadium, somebody starts the wave or the disturbance, the vibration, and then other people follow. Now, you may be part of that wave, but you just get up out of your seat, you transfer the energy, and then you go back to your resting place. So the wave looks like it's moving around the stadium, but the people or the particles of matter don't actually move. So that's fundamental with knowing about property of energy. Mechanical waves are the waves that need that medium in order to pass through. And just a quick recall of what a medium is, a medium is a solid, liquid, or gas. And we know back from first quarter in eighth grade that all matter is made up of atoms and molecules. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about transferring that energy through a medium of a solid, liquid, or gas. All right. We will get to electromagnetic waves next week when we start to talk about light energy or radiant energy. But in contrast, electromagnetic waves do not need a medium in order to pass. They can pass through empty space. All right, a couple of things I wanted to show you. Um, okay, I went on uh, how to demonstrate a wave and this is what they came up with. So um, any good science teacher has some good old, old candy in their closet. And that's what I had, and I just took some uh, skewers and put some duct tape, and it took me a little while to get it balanced, but this is what I've got. So if we were looking at this like a wave, and the gummy bears on here are kind of representing the particles of matter, and this would be pretty much what the matter would be at at its resting place. But if I made a disturbance, or a vibration. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a small one. So I'm just gonna gently tap the one skewer on this end, and you can see how my energy displacing this particular uh, particle made that energy transfer down the whole line. So let me do that again for you. Just a low energy wave. And then I'm gonna do it a little bit stronger, put some more energy into it and then the particles reacted appropriately. So one of the things we talked about when we talked about properties of waves, we talked about how a transverse wave, so that's our wave we see here, where it's going up and down. So the motion of the particles is what they call perpendicular, or at a 90 degree angle, to the wave direction. So the wave is going this way, but the particles are going up and down, right? So we've got that transverse wave energy. Now if I put more energy into it, that shows in the wave's amplitude. And that was one of the properties on the transverse wave that we had actually labeled. So we have this amplitude, the displacement of the, po the particles from its resting point to that top of that crest, or from the resting point to the bottom of the trough. Now, in a transverse wave, that energy propagation moving through is really easy to see. And the next thing I did for you is I talked about a compressional wave. Now compressional can also be called longitudinal. And that's where I went to our good old garden variety slinky. And the wave motion through a compressional wave, which we're going to talk a whole lot about in just a second because we're going to talk about my favorite compressional wave, which is sound. The propagation of that energy is a little different. 
it will actually, if I cause a disturbance, it moves through the matter in a side-to-side -side manner. Okay, so it goes with the wave direction or parallel to the direction of the wave. Okay, so that's our compressional wave. All right, that pretty much gets us caught up from last week. One of the things that we need to focus on today is how waves behave. And one of the things that we use to describe wave behavior, especially when we're talking about compressional waves, is the wave frequency. And that frequency, if you can picture, last time we were together, we pictured that a frequency, which is related to the wavelength, is how many times that wavelength passes by a one second doorway or a one second window. That helps you visualize how frequent the wave will be passing. And we use that wave property of wavelength in order to judge that. So in a transverse wave, that's really easy to see. We've got the wavelength from the crest to the crest is one wavelength or the trough to the trough. And you can visibly see that we can have some shorter wavelengths. So what does that mean for frequency? That means that the shorter wavelength, the waves are closer together, is going to give us some high frequency. The farther apart, the low frequency we have. One other wave property we got to be familiar with to move forward is amplitude. And again, amplitude, the more energy I put into that wave, the higher the amplitude that I have. All right, so that's easy to see in a transverse wave. In a compressional wave, not as much, but I'm going to walk you through it. If we look at the transverse wave compared to the compressional wave, now just to recall, the compressional wave has areas where the molecules are close together or under high pressure, and those are called the compressions, which is easy to remember because we've got a uh, compressional wave. And then we have areas of the compressional wave that are farther apart, so the particles are actually farther apart, it's a low pressure. And that is called a rarefaction. Now, we do have a wavelength and we do have amplitude with compressional waves. Not as easy to see though, but I'm going to try to do my best to show you how this looks. So I'm going to go over here to my, my fake drum. And I want you to think about my coffee can or my empty coffee container here as a, a drum. And imagine that I've got that tight drum uh, top here. And when I strike a drum, I'm actually pressing down on the top of the drum. I'm pressing it in. And what you may not really picture, but I'm about to use my good old pantyhose here to try to show you that, that when you press down, you actually move the uh, particles of air away from each other, and that creates space. So let me help you visualize this a little bit better, and I'm not gonna do this kind of exaggerated, so maybe that it'll show up a, a good for you. So imagine I'm pressing down on the top of my drum, and this, this painty hose with all these black dots on it represent the particles of air that are above the drum uh, surface. So I'm gonna do this kind of exaggerated, but if I were to tap the drum, you can imagine that the particles that are close to the drum now have space. So they're going to actually move down. So they're going to go down. Well, we know that it will go back to its resting place. So then it's going to release, go back to its resting position, and it's going to press that air up. And when it does that, it, it makes a compressional wave. So I've got this downward motion. It gives my molecule space. It pops back up, and then the molecules, in turn, transfer that energy back and forth. So if I'm continuously tapping on my drum, my po uh, the particles above it are moving up and down and up and down, and that wave of energy goes this way. If I could do my slinky that way, I would, but you can imagine it going side to side. So I press down, and it goes up, and that compressional wave moves out, and then we get to hear it from our, our receptors and our ear drums kind of interesting uh, correlation there. All right, another thing that's really neat is the tuning fork. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a, I jumped ahead of myself there. Um, so looking at sound properties for frequency. Frequency of a sound wave is determining the pitch. Now, I hate to put this, put you through this because I cannot sing, and here I am on live TV. I'm, I'm not gonna sing, actually. I'm just going to hum. We have a pitch, and if you think about pitch, you think high pitch, low pitch. 
Um, and I'll show you a, a real biological example of that in a little bit. So we have a low pitch is an infrasound, and we have a high pitch is an ultrasonic sound. Frequency is measured by hertz. Okay, so frequency again is how many times that wavelength passes by a one second window. Looking at amplitude for a sound wave, that's going to be talking about how compressed the compressions are. So how close those little dots are together. The more compressed they are, the more energy they have. Now amplitude of sound determines its volume. So quiet sounds have low energy. And really loud sounds have lots of energy. High amplitude. All right, and those are actually measured via decibel. I hope I woke you up. All right, so there's a cool app on your phone. You can actually pull, I'm gonna pull it up real quick. And I'm gonna hold it out for you so you can see it. I'm gonna hit play, and I'm actually going to show, <laughs> I just got fussed at by the sound guy. I'm gonna show on my phone how low sounds have low decibels. And high sounds have lots of decibels. <laughs> but you can get that on your phone and have fun with that as well. All right. Now here we are with our tuning forks. So tuning forks are kind of neat. I am not musically inclined at all, but I've seen my students uh, playing in band and I really respect somebody who has that ability, that talent. But a tuning fork works the same way that our drum works. So when I strike a tuning fork, the two prongs will vibrate back and forth and we know that a vibration or a disturbance causes energy to be transferred. And the tuning fork acts the same way as our drum. So when I strike it, the prongs are displaced, which gives that air molecule around it some space. And then when they go back to their resting position, they actually cause that compression to propagate. So we can hear it. We can hear it pretty easily, but I want to show it to you also. So I'm going to strike the tuning fork. And that's a fairly low pitch for our tuning fork. But if I get a different tuning fork of a different composition, it actually has a very high pitch to it. But this is more fun if you can see it. So I've got a bowl of water, and I'm going to actually strike the tuning fork, and I'm going to touch the water with it. And you can see not only can we hear it through the air, but we're also going to see it displace the water. So did you see that? If I give it even more energy, it can really make a mess. Cool. All right, so let's get talking about some specific wave behavior. So now that we understand some wave properties, let's talk about some wave behavior. And some of these you're gonna be very familiar with and you're gonna give me a big thumbs up when you hear them. Like this one, reflection. So if we're talking about a reflection, most of the time people think of what we're looking at in a mirror, for example. So we see our reflection, and that's talking about light reflection, and we will talk about that next week. Right now we're gonna focus on sound reflection. So it's the same idea. So we have a source of the sound. So the sound comes from a source, and it will propagate away from that source. And in the uh, idea about reflection, the sound waves hit another object and will actually send a wave back toward the source. Now we're lucky, we have a sound source like our mouth and then we also have a sound receiver which is like our ears. Well other animals do too, like bats use echolocation. So echo is just the reflection of sound. Um, other animals that use echolocation like dolphins or porpoises and of course, we have some man-made sources of uh, echolocation like sonar use in submarines. So that's just a wave who has propagated away from the source and is being reflected back to some type of sound receiver. So wave behavior, reflection. Another type of wave behavior is called refraction. Refraction. That is a little trickier. That's when a wave will actually go through a medium and it will change speed if it changes from an, into another medium. So we've got, uh, I've got an example here. The best example I could think of is ultrasound. So ultrasound 
is wave sound waves that are propagated from a little um, handle, a little tool. And those sound waves will propagate through the body and then give an image back for diagnostic reasons. Well, one of the things that ultrasonographers learn in their school is how they have to deal with a business or behavior of refraction. So if the sound wave, for example, is going through uh, just a room of air, for example, and then it hits a window. Now we know that it just went from air to a solid and then back to air again. So you're not gonna hear the same crisp sound that you hear if you were standing in the same room with somebody if it has to go through two mediums, like air to a solid. So the same thing happens with ultrasound. So people who do ultrasound will uh, account for what's called refraction. So that sound wave goes through this soft tissue, like our skin and our fat, and then it hits something like muscle, which is a lot more dense. Okay, recall density from first semester. We talked about how close particles were packed together in a given amount of space. So we have much more dense muscle that the sound wave has to travel through. So the wave will actually change speed. And that means that it changes direction as well. So uh, we'll talk about another cool example of refraction with light next week. So, so far we have reflection, refraction, and now we have diffraction. And sometimes people get diffraction and refraction a little bit confused, but refraction deals with the sound going through a medium into another medium and it changes speed. Diffraction is a little bit different. Um, if you've ever like eavesdropped on your parents talking in another room, you know what I'm talking about. Like they can't see you, but you can hear them because sound diffracts through an opening. So as the sound waves travel, they'll go through the opening and spread back out again. That's how you can stay around the corner and hear what they're saying. Not that you would ever do that. I never did. Um, another cool example of uh, diffraction is, was observed in a zoo, actually. Uh, a lady working with elephants noticed that the elephants were communicating without actually making a sound out of their mouths. And one of the things that they noticed were that the elephants make a very low rumble. And if you take your hand and put it on your throat and hum, mm, you can feel that vibration. Well, elephants do the same thing, but they do it at a very, very, very low pitch. And lower pitches or lower frequencies will diffuse more. And so elephants use that to their advantage. And funny enough, they don't sense it with their ears. They actually sense it with their feet but they sense that rumble, and those certain rumbles will communicate what the herd needs to do. And if you're one of my eighth grade guys whose voice is changing, you have also probably been told, ah, oh, keep your voice down, your voice carries. Especially people with deep voices, their voices carry. So that's kind of the same idea. The elephants use that low rumble, and they will, um, the sound diffuses more, so they're able to communicate with part of their herd that is really, really far away. Kind of cool. All right. One of the things that I wanted to show you is the effect, like visually effect, of that low rumble, that, that um, vibration. And so I pulled up some good bass music for us. And I've got, I'm going to pause it here real quick so I can explain to you. I've got salt here um, spread over a piece of cellophane. Let me pause it for us. There we go. And I'm going to take uh, my handy dandy amplifier here because it's going to make our sound a little bit louder. And I want you to visualize kind of the difference between the low pitches and the high pitches and the effects on the salt.
could listen to that all day, but that's for another episode. All right, so I hope you noticed that when the sound got very deep, there was a lot of reaction by the salt particles on this membrane. They bounced higher, and when the sound got very high pitched, there might have been a little bit of vibration, but not as much energy transferred. All right, wrapping this up. So we're looking at wave properties. So we have our transverse wave with our amplitude and frequency. Now you've been introduced to our compressional wave with its amplitude and frequency and how it relates to pitch and volume. We are looking also, at, I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead of myself. There we go. We have um, one more wave behavior, I apologize. We have one more wave behavior, interference. And some of my uh, hunters or people who shoot at a shooting range will go, yes, I know what she's talking about. Um, our fourth wave behavior. Our fourth wave behavior was interference. So we have these waves, they have certain wave lengths and they have a certain pattern to them. And sometimes the waves will actually build on each other. So that's when we have waves that are sent out and the wave lengths match up to each other. So you can imagine if I have one wave at this frequency and I have a second wave come through at the same frequency or if they're meeting, they actually will build. And that's called a constructive interference. But on the other end, if I have uh, a wave coming in at one wavelength and I send the other wavelength in at a different time, then those waves will cross over each other and actually cancel each other out. And that we interpret as a lot less volume, a lot less um, amplitude. So one of the examples I have for that is that we have um, noise canceling headsets. And they're actually really interesting to look at the technology inside those headsets. Um, if you go to um, uh, the gun range, for example, and you need to be able to hear for safety, you need to be able to hear things around you, but you want to protect your eardrums from a sudden loud sound like a gunshot. Or if you're a gamer and you want to just hear your game, but you don't want to hear everybody in your household around you, you might invest in some really good sound canceling headsets. Uh, pilots. Pilots also use headsets to be able to cancel out the engine noise so that they can hear the, the air control tower, for example. But that utilizes, that technology utilizes a wave behavior called interference, and it's called destructive interference. And they actually send back a wave out of the headsets, for example, that cancel out that incoming noise. Kind of neat. Okay, that's what it looks like in a picture. So we have constructive interference, the waves build on each other. That pink line shows that they have gained energy. And then we have destructive interference at the bottom where the waves will actually cancel each other out. All right, I'm gonna move on so I can close this up real quick. There we go, that's where I was trying to get to a minute ago. All right, so we have compressional waves. Okay, remember there are mechanical waves. We have two main properties of those compressional mechanical sound waves of pitch and loudness, which relate to frequency and amplitude. They can be reflected, refracted, diffracted, and I almost forgot our last one, interfered with. So we can have two types. We can have constructive and destructive interference. So, all right, mustered through that. Sorry, guys. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a lot. We're gonna do the same kind of thing with light next week, okay? So radiant energy. The only difference is that that electromagnetic energy doesn't need a medium in order to pass through. So I'm Miss May. This has been eighth grade physical science. I hope to see you back next Wednesday at 1030.